every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello everyone, my name is Scott Sorrell and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the eighth installment of Balkan's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar is titled Choline's Long-Lasting Impact on Animal Health and Performance with Dr. Heather White from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. White, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction and thank you to the organizers for having me here. I know in this uh, this different time of working remotely, it, it takes opportunities like these for us to continue to connect. So I appreciate the invitation to share some of our research and the chance to connect with those of you. So thank you for taking the time to tune in and listen. And uh, I hope that we can have a good discussion about some of the research that's been done. So right off the bat, I want to um, thank some colleagues. What I'm gonna tell you today is a really interesting story that unfolded uh, as colleagues at University of Florida, namely the late Charlie Staples and his PhD student at the time, Marco Zanobi, were doing some cow studies that we collaborated on. And along the same timeline, we were doing cell culture experiments in my lab uh, with uh, Tawny Chandler and Sophia Erb. And uh, you know, it was a lot of fun to, to talk about results as we were both yielding the results. And it, uh, it turned out to be a really interesting story. So I want to thank that group out of the University of Florida right off the bat. Um, of course, always acknowledgments at the end, but, but much of this will be their data that I share with you. So as we all know, the transition to lactation period is a, is a period that can potentially be full of metabolic challenge, although it's also a period that's full of great opportunity to us as nutritionists. And most of these challenges and opportunity are born out of the change in energy balance as the cow approaches parturition. So, so shown here, one of these classic figures with on the horizontal axis are days relative to calving, uh, with this vertical line here being the time of calving or parturition. And I've, I have graphed here net energy for lactation, although we could draw a similar curve for glucose or, or any other nutrients for that matter. And so as the cow is in her dry period, the energy that she requires, shown in the blue line, X is, uh, is easily met by what's consumed, shown in the yellow line here. And so the cow is in positive energy balance, depicted by calculation as the green line. And we know that dry cows are, in fact, uh, often in positive energy balance. They're easy keepers, sometimes a little too easy, and we have to, we have to make sure we manage that nutritionally. But what begins to happen a week or so before parturition naturally is that her feed intake decreases. And that dry matter intake decrease combines with the drastic increase in energy requirement at, with the onset of lactation results in that animal going into a period of negative energy balance. Now, again, we often refer to this as negative energy balance, but that's a little bit overgeneralized because in fact, it's negative energy balance, it's negative glucose balance, negative amino acid balance. And so many of those micronutrients, uh, as well as the macronutrients or, or energy, if we wanna think of it that way, are uh, insufficient during that time to meet the needs of lactation. And so this can either be a challenge for that cow and can lead to metabolic disorders or challenge in adaptation uh, to the transition itself, or it can in fact be an opportunity for us nutritionally to meet her needs. So if we think about the cow during a non-transition period, so whether this is a med or late lactation cow, our job as nutritionists is to ensure that what we feed her can go into the rumen, be fermented, we know that she's absorbing things different than the profile of what we feed her, uh, and can provide precursors that she needs to support milk production. So here I've shown the example of glucose, where feed would go into the rumen and be fermented. In the case of glucose, let's use the primary volatile fatty acid that's a glucose precursor, propionate, as an example. 
propionate is then absorbed and taken up by the liver where it goes through gluconeogenesis to produce glucose. That glucose is then exported from the liver, goes to the mammary gland for, to support lactose production, uh, and then contributes to milk production. And we know that this is key because very little glucose is absorbed directly from the diet in ruminant animals and because the liver is primarily responsible for generating that glucose. The final aspect that's key there is that glucose, of course, is the precursor for lactose, the fluid volume regulator in milk. So if we're doing our job well in mid or late lactation, this all goes on fine. The cow is in positive or neutral energy balance, and she has the feed precursor she needs to support milk production. But as we just went through, during the time leading up to parturition, during that transition period, we have decreased dry matter intake. And even after calving, her feed intake cannot, uh, it does not sufficiently match her energy and her glucose requirement. And so she's in this negative energy balance, negative glucose balance state. And our job as a nutritionist has to change a little in that time period. Now our job has to be to support the transition cow which means working with what the homeoretic changes are and what the adaptations are that allow her to support milk production during that time. So because she has decreased contribution of glucose precursors from the diet, those still exist, she's still consuming feed, but again, they don't meet the requirement, she'll mobilize body stores. So the one we think of the most is mobilization of adipose tissue. And that adipose tissue, as a reminder, is stored as a triglyceride. So glycerol backbone and three fatty acids. And those fatty acids can be variable, but there's a pretty distinctive profile of fatty acids within stored adipose tissue. The fatty acids themselves, when mobilized, or NEFA, non-esterified fatty acids, so no longer on this glycerol backbone, have two potential fates. One is that they can go directly to the mammary gland or other tissues as an energy precursor or in the mammary gland can be used as a precursor for milk fat synthesis. But the one we think of the most and uh, arguably takes up a large proportion of the NEFA is uptake by the liver for energy production. The fatty acids that were attached to a glycerol backbone are mobilized, okay? And that glycerol is also mobilized with it. So we have to think about the fate of glycerol, which is unique from NEFA, a different fate that glycerol is taken up by the liver and can be used as a glucose precursor through the gluconeogenic pathway, just with a different entry point compared to other glucose precursors. That glucose then, just like any other glucose generated in the liver, can be taken up by the mammary gland for milk lactose. So supporting the transition cow means balancing and optimizing these pathways. When we think about NEFA going for energy metabolism, that's clearly a positive fate. The energy needs, or the liver needs energy. Uh, the pathways the liver uh, goes through metabolically are very energetically demanding, whether it's dealing with amino acids, metabolizing those amino acids into protein, or even gluconeogenesis itself, very energetically demanding. But what we know is that there is a capacity to how much fatty acid can be completely oxidized to energy in the liver at any point in time. And as that capacity or that negative feedback is reached, there are alternative pathways for those fatty acids. One of those is incomplete oxidation to ketone bodies, uh, such as BHB or beta-hydroxybutyrate. These ketone bodies get a bad rap, but in and of themselves, they're not a bad thing. This is actually an alternative energy precursor that can be exported from the liver which ATP can't be, so exported from the liver to send energy equivalents to other tissues within the body. Although uh, they do have a function in whole body energy metabolism, what we've learned is that if the production of ketones from the liver or absorption from the rumen exceeds the peripheral tissue use, then blood concentrations of ketones such as BHB increase, and we've also learned that beyond a certain point, there are negative outcomes associated with a high blood ketone concentration. The other alternative fate for those fatty acids is to be re-esterified back onto a glycerol backbone and stored in the liver as triglyceride. So in order to balance these the best, 
my lab and the focus of many other labs uh, as well is to learn how these are regulated and balanced and how we can support them nutritionally so that this transition dairy cow can in fact have the precursor she needs to support milk production. One of the nutritional strategies that have been found to influence these pathways is choline. And when rumen protected choline was fed historically, the keynote uh, finding was that there was a decrease in liver triglyceride. And this was found in dairy cows, but also found across other species uh, and really of great interest. At this point, uh, there's been a lot of research done feeding rumen protected choline across the transition period. A recently published uh, meta-analysis looked at 21 transition cow studies that covered 1,300 cows across 66 different treatment means. And these meta-analyses are really uh, useful scientifically because they allow us to look across the body of the literature. You know, within any one study, sometimes we see different degrees of uh, response and studies have different treatment doses or different uh, days, different number of cows. So these meta-analyses allow us to look across the field of research and see what the consensus is or what the general take home is. So across this meta-analyses uh, of all of these different transition cow studies, the average supplementation was 12.9 grams of choline ion pre and postpartum. So again, during the transition period, and what was noted was a significant increase in milk yield, about 1.6 kilograms per day, uh, an increase in energy correct in milk, about 1.7 kilograms per day. Milk fat yield was increased uh, about 0.07 kilograms per day. Milk protein yield also increased in that same range, about 0.05 kilograms per day. And dry matter intake pre and postpartum increased by 0.2 and 0.5 kilos per day, respectively. So what was also interesting in this and uh, not what we're going to focus on today, but they looked at potential interactions of prepartum choline and methionine in this meta-analysis. Uh, and within the average choline dose and the range of metabolizable, pro metabolizable methionine supplemented, there was no interaction. So right at this 12.9 grams per day choline ion, um, there was limited interaction, although some of the models suggest at higher concentrations, uh, there may be. What we're going to focus on today, though, is the impact, these impacts of milk, of choline supplementation on milk production. So this is one of the studies out of the University of Florida that I referenced earlier, um, and I'll set this figure up for you. The horizontal axis is uh, weak relative to calving. Um, and cows were supplemented with rumen protected choline from three weeks prior to calving to three weeks after calving. Those cows supplemented in choline are in orange and the control cows, uh, no choline supplementation are in blue. And this figure shows energy correct in milk. Now during the period of supplementation, we can see what the meta-analysis just indicated, which is an increase in energy correct in milk and cows supplemented with choline compared to those that were not. But what was really interesting within this study is that they were able to, Charlie Staples Group was able to follow the cows beyond the period of supplementation. So although they were only supplemented to 21 days after calving, they were able to record and follow the cows for 15 weeks after calving. And what was noted was a maintained increase in milk production and in energy corrected milk, as shown in this figure, across that 15 weeks. So this is a tendency across the whole period, um, just about five pounds per milk per day increase in favor of the cow supplemented with choline. Now remember the choline supplementation stopped at 21 days after calving. And so this raised a lot of interest because of this persistent increase in milk production that lasted long after the supplementation ended. So the positive impact of rumen protected choline supplementation is well documented and several meta-analyses I showed the most recent uh, have, have shown consistent results.
But there are two long lasting impacts that are of great interest right now that we'll talk about today and focus on. The first one is this evidence for sustained impact after choline supplementation ceases. So how is it that choline supplementation that ends at plus 21 days relative to calving uh, or after calving still has an impact on milk production through uh, much of the lactation? And so we were curious uh, within our discussions if this was indirect benefits or if this was through improved metabolic function during that period that uh, allowed the persistency in milk benefit. The other aspect of long-lasting effects or potential long-lasting effects is that when we're supplementing a prepartum cow, we have the potential to influence the calf that she's carrying at that time. And so we wanted to address potential in utero programming or nutritional programming, uh, and then also address if there's any influence on the colostrum or a difference in the calf when supplemented with colostrum from a choline supplemented dam. So let's start with the first one. How is milk production increased during and after supplementation of rumen protected choline? This is a really complex question to ask no matter what topic or nutrient we're talking about, because as we all know, there's a lot that happens within the cow. We feed something and we may have taken uh, meticulous care to change only one thing in the ration, but when we feed it to the animal, all we have is output. So we have milk, we have milk composition, maybe we can take blood samples uh, or fecal samples, and if it's a really involved study, we may take liver biopsy samples. But there are always these confounding effects of what else is happening with the cow. And so a model that we've used within my lab um, and certainly other labs have used this as well is the use of primary liver cells. So primary meaning directly harvested from an animal, liver cells that we can culture. Now there aren't immortalized cow liver cells available like there are for other species. So this primary hepatocyte cells uh, that we can get directly from the calf are the best model in cell culture that we have to use. And the benefit of this model is that we can specifically uh, adjust different nutrients and it allows us to zoom in on different pathways. So we can mimic the conditions that the liver may see, if you will, during the transition period while excluding other confounders. So what might be an example of this? If we're interested in lipid metabolism, uh, here's a picture at the top of these cells, and these are stained, fluorescent stains, and each of these blue circles represents the nuclei of each liver cell in culture. And so if we uh, culture these cells without fatty acids, we can see very little accumulation of lipid, which is stained in red, and we can measure what's happening within the cells. We can put substrates and nutrients in the media that mimic what the transition cow may see or what uh, may be circulating in blood in the cow. If we wanted to mimic the transition period, we can do that by putting fatty acids on, for example. And we can make those fatty acid profiles represent the concentration and the makeup or composition of the fatty acids that we would see in NEFA in circulation in the cow. When in fact we expose these cells to fatty acids, we get a very characteristic accumulation of lipid within the cells. You can see much more red in the bottom. Of course, we quantify this, but a picture is worth a thousand words. And so this shows you that we're very, uh, very consistently able to um, mimic the accumulation of lipid in cells that we see postpartum in cows. The other benefit of this model is it allows us to eliminate some of the confounders we deal with in a transition cow study. So those of you who have participated in these studies know that there are a million things that can happen with transition cows, whether it's mastitis or metritis, retained placenta. Um, you know, all of these factors can influence her and uh, necessitate us to have larger studies with more cows and uh, complicate the analysis. So cell culture studies are a good way for us to look at specific pathways and to look at a lot of different treatments or linear response to treatment combinations or concentrations. And it allows us to zoom in on specific pathways in ways that are more challenging to do in the cow. So if we think about the pathways I showed you earlier, 
we can take these cells then and we can use radio labeled tracers to see where each of these precursors go to. We can measure protein abundance and gene expression, and we can measure output like glucose or BHB that are secreted from the cells themselves. So it gives us the ability to look at these pathways really closely. So we did a series of experiments uh, that looked at uh, increasing concentrations of choline supplemented to the cells, to the liver cells, in the presence of fatty acids. And I won't uh, overwhelm you with all of the details of those studies, uh, but suffice it to summarize with this, a figure similar to what I showed earlier, where we have fatty acids coming to, um, the diagram shows liver, but of course, in this case, we're talking about liver cells. And those fatty acids are broken down to their two carbon building blocks, acetyl-CoA, and they can go to these potential pathways I denoted earlier. TCA cycle for energy production, uh, ketogenesis for ketone body production, or reesterification to lipids. And what we've found through gene expression and through uh, radio label tracing is that when we increase the concentration of choline supplemented to the cells, we observe an increase in oxidation, complete oxidation of those fatty acids. We observe a decrease in ketone body production or BHB production uh, in the cells, uh, also measured as acid soluble products using radio labeled tracers. And we denote a decrease or we detect a decrease in lipid accumulation within the cells, so cellular lipids. Now this is, as I mentioned earlier, the classic benefit of choline supplementation that had been noted for quite a while in the literature. And it was hypothesized that this decrease in lipid accumulation was due to the increase in VLDL export. So just as you or I would go to the doctor and get a lipid profile uh, and find out our VLDL, HDL, and LDL, um, VLDL has a critical component of phosphatidylcholine uh, and it was hypothesized that this, much like in rodents and humans, was the means for choline supplementation in a cow to decrease liver lipids or cellular lipids. However, it's very, it's very difficult to quantify VLDL, so for a long time we didn't have direct evidence of that. In our cell culture experiments, we were able to quantify VLDL and observe that a decrease in lipids um, was associated also with an increase in VLDL. Some of the other findings that we found through the cell culture experiments were that uh, there was an increase in glycogen production within cells when supplemented with choline and a decrease in reactive oxygen species. Now reactive oxygen species are a naturally occurring byproduct of fatty acid oxidation. And we know that they, um, they, they come with fatty acid oxidation we also know that excessive accumulation that can't be mitigated by antioxidants can be bad to the cells. Although we're not at a point yet where we really have a threshold or an idea of how much is too much. I can give you a visual of this um, as well, where the cells on the left, again, blue are nuclei, so each blue is a cell, and the green represents oxygen, reactive oxygen species. And without choline, we see more green than on the right with choline, we see less green uh, stain there. We quantified this um, quantitatively, but again, just a visual to help demonstrate what this impact is. So we'll come back to the role of antioxidants and inflammation and immune system a little bit later. But one thing that uh, this really ties into is the presence of antioxidants and the potential uh, relationship with other methyl donors within the cells. And so when I say methyl donors, just so we're all on the same page, we're talking about a labile carbon uh, at the end of a molecule. So a methyl group has a carbon and three hydrogens. This green line here represents some other molecule it's attached to. But uniquely, these methyl groups have to be labile. They have to be able to be donated to other molecules or nutrients. And so as we look across some of the methyl donors, we see that labile methyl group, methionine shown at the top here with one methyl group, choline and betaine having three, uh, and arguably the most important in human nutrition is folate or folic acid, we hear about a lot, and it has one methyl group as well. 
And the reason that I bring these up is because this methyl donation becomes a really important part of understanding how these nutrients work uh, within the cow. And then as we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, potentially within the calf that's developing in utero at the time of supplementation. So how do these all connect? Uh, this is what I mentioned earlier with choline leading to phosphatidylcholine, uh, which is one of the key uh, components of VLDL packaging and export. Again, that pathway to get lipids out of the liver so that they can be used by other tissues instead of remaining stored in the liver. And the connection here with other nutrients and with the oxidative pathways gets rather complicated, where choline can go downstream to betaine, and betaine can serve, again, as a methyl donor, as can folates, shown here in the middle of the circle, the tetrahydrofolate pathway. And those methyl donors can be key in regenerating methionine. So I'm sure you guys have, uh, have listened or looked at the data with the interactions between methionine and choline. We're not going to focus on that today, but this cycle here, just as the TCA cycle uh, relies on carriers and nutrient balance, the methionine can go to SAM, which is the universal methyl donor, and those methyl groups can be donated uh, to hundreds of pathways within the cells. That methyl group, once, uh, once delivered or once given away, SAM becomes SAH, homocysteine, and only with the addition of a methyl group can that homocysteine be used to regenerate methionine. We're not talking about making methionine from scratch. We're all well aware that this is an essential amino acid that can't be made by mammalian cells. We're talking about here adding the methyl group back. But what's pertinent to today's discussion is that downstream of this homocysteine and cysteine and downstream of the betaine um, through the dimethylglycine pathway is glutathione, an antioxidant. And so that antioxidant can uh, be used to neutralize those reactive oxygen species that are generated by fatty acid oxidation. What we've learned in the literature and much of this up until um, the recent body of work, much of this was learned from other species. But what we've learned is that if we have a lack of methyl donors, then we see each of these aspects of the pathways disturbed. We see increased liver inflammation because there's not as much, um, likely there's not as much antioxidant to neutralize uh, inflammation, oxidative stress. We see decreased liver oxidation of fatty acids. And the transition period in the cow, this is incredibly important to help use the mobilized fatty acids that she uh, is, is trying to use to meet the energy deficit. And we also see a decrease in methylation of DNA. And we haven't talked about this one yet this morning, but all DNA in the body goes through methylation cycles. And this is incredibly important, especially in offspring. And so within rodent studies, what we have found is that if we deprive a gestating uh, dam of methyl donors, we see impacts on methylation of DNA in the offspring, and we see changes in that offspring's metabolism. So why is that? This is based on the concept of nutritional programming or fetal programming uh, when it takes place in utero, in which the DNA shown in this cartoon here uh, it has to be methylated. And this methylation represents the epigenome, which is the impact of the genotype on the phenotype that's not just due to the base pairs. So not just due to those nucleotides, but rather due to the pattern of methylation that influences the gene expression. And so what we know is that depending on what we eat, there are nutrients, and I mentioned these earlier in the pathway, so the folic acid, methionine, uh, choline, betaine, all of those are contributing methyl groups through SAM donating methyl groups uh, to methylate the DNA. And so animal studies have shown that a diet with too little of these methyl donating nutrients before or just after birth causes certain regions of the DNA to be undermethylated. And some of these impacts are lifelong impacts. And we've known this for a while in human nutrition because we understand concepts that depending on what the mother eats during pregnancy, that can have an impact on the offspring. And also if that offspring is female, it can have an impact uh, on her subsequent offspring because of those reproductive cells already present in her body. 
So depending on what nutrients the mother's consuming during the critical points in time, this can have immediate and long-term effects of offspring. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna date myself here a little bit. I guess I'm starting to get to that point in my career, but as a graduate student, I remember this being a very exciting thing that I learned uh, in a nutrition class that was taught across species. So it was actually from a human nutrition department. And I couldn't help but think that we were ignoring something pretty big here. Because when we think about the reproductive cycle in dairy cows, we're breeding heifers at 14 months. They have a nine month gestation period. They calve in, they start producing milk. And at peak lactation, you know, maybe 60 days postpartum, we breed those animals. And depending on that, uh, on that animal, on the diet, that cow may be just approaching nutrient, neutral energy balance at that point. The cow may still be in negative energy balance, um, but we breed her. And then she goes through gestation and we dry her off. Um, and then we have a, a period of time where we set her up for that next transition period or her prepartum period. And so I couldn't help but think that we were ignoring potential for nutrient programming or fetal programming in cows. And uh, you know, at the time there wasn't a lot of work focusing on this, but since then I think a lot of people have really um, contributed to this. And we've started to learn that there's a potential, a huge potential for influencing the calf through prepartum supplementation of the cow. So if we step back and remember what was happening in the cow in terms of methyl groups uh, and methyl donation, as we supplement choline, we saw, we observed an increased methyl group donation pattern and increased methionine regeneration. And this was in the cell culture work. Uh, there's been some similar findings or supporting findings in cow studies as well. And so if we are potentially influencing the methyl donation or the methyl doning ability of the nutrients prepartum, what does this mean to the cow and her calf? So at the University of Florida in that transition cow study that I showed you energy corrected milk production from earlier uh, and in some subsequent studies, they were able to follow the calves from birth to 50 weeks of age. Uh, and this on the left will be heifers. So in the first study, uh, this was the cow study they did in 2015, they observed about a tenth of a pound per day increase in average daily gain, and that was across 35 heifers. And in the next study, they followed the calves as well, the heifer calves, and also observed a tenth of a pound per day average daily gain in favor of choline supplemented dams. So remember, those calves themselves were not supplemented with choline. This was only uh, when the dams were supplemented choline prepartum. They also followed bulls and these bulls just to note were given an LPS challenge, but even with that challenge, they observed an increase in average daily gain um, by about a quarter of a pound a day in favor of the calves that were born to cows supplemented with choline, 38 calves within that. And so there was this pattern of increased average daily gain in calves uh, that were born to dams supplemented with choline. And they wanted to look a little deeper in that. Um, and so they measured a few other things out of those studies. Um, again, orange in these graphs denotes the calves that were born to dams supplemented with choline in utero. And the blue were calves born to control dams, no choline supplementation. And this figure here shows the percent of heifers with fever. And so they were trying to uh, have a first look at potential immune strength or immune response. And what they found was a tendency for calves born to cows supplemented with choline to have fewer fevers. These were measured daily and noted. Um, and so that was a very interesting thing as an initial finding. They continued to dig into this and they looked at leukocytes within the blood of these calves and they found a tendency for more leukocytes within the blood of calves born to cows supplemented with choline uh, during the prepartum period. So altogether, choline supplementation in the prepartum period, so at the end of gestation, led to increased average daily gain in those calves, both in heifer calves and in bull calves, increased immune maturation and function, 
And so they found that within terms of fever and leukocytes. And although I didn't show it here, they had increased lung development and maturation, um, which as, as many of us know, is a key challenge within the neonatal calf. So it's, it's hard to think about um, the effect of late gestation or in utero without wondering how much of it was gestation itself or the in utero environment and how much of it was potentially because of colostrum. We know that there are ways to influence colostrum. And so uh, Charlie's group asked just that, is there an additional benefit from colostrum? And so what they were able to do was factorialize the calves of the study. So this top box represents the in utero environment, either no choline supplementation to the dam or choline supplementation to the dam. And then those calves were either given colostrum from the treatment group that represented their in utero effect, or they were given colostrum from the opposing treatment group of the dams. So calves born to cows that were not supplemented with choline were given colostrum from choline supplemented dams. And so this is a, a well-used experimental design in rodent fetal programming studies that allows us to separate out the in utero effect from the colostrum effect. And so uh, as they looked at these, I'll note that there was no additional effect of the colostrum source on average daily gain, but really interestingly, they found changes in apparent efficiency of IgG absorption. One of our key goals out of colostrum is for that IgG to be absorbed. And so what is, um, what's demonstrated here, the blue again, calves born to cows not supplemented with choline, the orange, calves born to cows supplemented with choline, and no difference between these two groups in IgG absorption. But when we look at the influence of colostrum, um, so if we take calves, the second blue bar here, calves born to cows not supplemented with choline, but we give them colostrum from cows supplemented with choline, or the in utero effect of choline plus the colostrum effect of choline, we see an increase in apparent efficiency of IgG absorption. And so again, the first two bars I had shown represented no difference in IgG absorption based on in utero choline or not. But when we add choline, uh, choline supplemented dam colostrum to either of those treatments, then we observe this increase in apparent efficiency of IgG absorption. And so as we piece this all together, the impact of rumen protected supplementation of choline is, is well documented and we have several meta-analyses to support that. Um, but you know, there's always more questions to be answered and there's always more things piquing our interest. So there's evidence for sustained impact after rumen protected choline supplementation ceases on milk production. And when we take together the cow studies and the cell culture studies, it, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that rumen protected choline supplementation in the cow may support liver function. And when we supplement choline within the cell culture, uh, we see changes in these pathways, decreased lipid storage, uh, decreased reactive oxygen species secretion and ketone body production, increased glucose and energy production um, and supporting of methyl donation. And this is cell culture work, but certainly within the cow studies, the transition cow studies, we can see supporting evidence for several of these pathways as well. The other potential for long lasting effect is on the calf that's in the developing or is developing in utero during the prepartum period. And so as we look closer at that as a whole field of research, um, you know, certainly rumen protected choline has been of interest and supplementation prepartum increases average daily gain in the calves across several studies and improves immune function within the calves. And colostrum from rumen protected choline supplemented animals has an additional um, improvement in IgG absorption in calves, uh, despite the in utero choline supplementation or not. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all those that contributed uh, within my lab, Tani Chandler, uh, Sophia Erb were, were certainly the ones that contributed the most to the cell culture work that you saw. And again, collaboration with the University of Florida, 
uh, Dr. Charlie Staples and Dr. Marcos Sanobi, um, great collaborative partners there. Uh, contributions to funding um, and support. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Heather. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a, a real quick uh, one minute video, and then we'll be right back with everybody's questions. With today's low milk prices and rising feed protein costs, now is the time to turn up the dial on rumen efficiency. NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen is designed to help stabilize rumen ammonia pools by synchronizing carbohydrate and nitrogen availability to the microflora. Providing a consistent supply of ammonia is proven to increase rumen microbial populations, improve fiber and dry matter digestibility, and stimulate microbial protein yield, all leading to greater efficiencies in forage utilization and higher milk and milk component production. Maximize rumen microflora with NitroSure to turn up rumen efficiency and productivity. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane on your attendee control panel. Dr. White, our first question is from uh, Dr. Rodriguez. Which is the main factor determining the capacity of the liver to complete oxidation of fatty acids in the liver? That's a great question. Um, so there's a few different ways to look at this. Most directly, the capacity of the TCA cycle to oxidize the fatty acids is dependent on the availability of the carrier, which in this case with TCA cycle is oxaloacetate. And so we can think about the cycle like a carousel, only as many kids can ride the carousel as the number of horses on the carousel. And the same is true uh, with the TCA cycle. Only as many acetyl-CoA building blocks can be completely oxidized as oxaloacetates are available to carry those carbons through the TCA cycle. And that oxaloacetate is regenerated uh, or recovered each time because two carbons are lost, if you will, or oxidized to energy through the process. But there's a lot of other things that will influence this as well. One of the things that we know well biochemically is that there's production of energy equivalents and those energy equivalents are used through uh, oxidative phosphorylation or resp respiration to generate ATP. And that ATP and the ratio of ATP to ADP within the cell will send feedback. And so while we're always interested in increasing the oxidative capacity by having more oxaloacetate available, we also have to be aware that there's some energy feedback within the cell uh, that at some point is going to trump the system, if we will, or, or is going to override and tell the cell we don't need more energy right now, uh, use those precursors for something else. So one of the things that we study quite a bit in my lab is uh, how to influence the capacity and if we can in fact increase it by doing things like increasing the uh, potential amount of oxaloacetate available to increase oxidation. So I'd say that those are the two main determinants um, and uh, we see increases in capacity for oxidation of about 10% at the time of calving. So we knew that it can be changed to a certain extent um, still working on trying to figure out if we can change it much more than that. Excellent. Uh, our next question is from Rachel, and she would like to know, it says, in the meta-analysis that you referenced, was there an interaction between postpartum choline and methionine? And if so, what did it indicate? Yeah, that's a good question. So that meta-analysis um, was published earlier this year, and I believe that um, Dr. Jose Santos has done a, a full webinar going into great detail, so I'd suggest you look at that for more. Um, my understanding from working through that meta-analysis is that at the concentration that choline was supplemented, the average concentration, there was no interaction. Um, but he does present some really interesting linear uh, models, and so they look very straight with very little variance, and we have to remember that those are modeled or predicted. Um, but as we look at those at the higher concentrations of methionine, um, so 
arguably more than the three to one ratio that uh, we would typically think of as our benchmark, then there is less of an impact of increasing choline supplementation. So that suggests that there is an interaction at the higher concentrations um, if we really want to precisely feed those nutrients. So I think that that's something we've got to dig into more. Now, if we think about that in context of the studies that uh, we've done with cell culture and that we've seen in different transition cow studies, we don't see an interaction between choline and methionine when we do those studies. And again, I think it's because we're, we're focused on feeding the, um, you know, the recommended range or the field average range across most of those studies. So I think it's interesting and we'll have to dive into that more at those higher concentrations. Um, but I think the meta-analyses confirmed what we'd seen at uh, the cow studies and the in vivo studies that at the most commonly supplemented concentrations for methionine and choline, there doesn't appear to be an interaction, likely because each of those have different biological priorities. Very well, thank you. Uh, Gideon would like to know if, um, if there's a way to know the choline status of a dairy cow. I wish it was really easy, Gideon, because then our lives would be easier as a researcher. So uh, to answer that question, um, we have to think about all the places that choline is at any point in time in the animal's body. So something like glucose is easier to measure because it is in the form of glucose or glycogen, and we can measure lactose in the milk, we can measure glucose in the blood. Um, still a complex story, but a little easier. As we know from thinking about different vitamins, some are stored in tissues like adipose or liver and also have a concentration. Choline is even one step more complicated than that in that it is in um, phospholipids that are in VLDL, but also in all of the cell membranes, all the bilipid membranes within the cells across the whole body. So if we truly wanna get an idea of how much choline is in the body, we would have to quantify all of those pools, which is, as you can guess, very challenging. A few things that we've been learning to do are to quantify the LDL, but then also to quantify the choline moieties within the blood. So much of that um, is a method refined by Dr. Joe McFadden. And within that method, there are hundreds of choline moieties or species that we can detect in the blood. Again, the same moieties and species in the milk. So um, to be able to quantify all choline in the body is really hard. What I think we've focused on across the field is being able to quantify which moieties change when we supplement or not so that we have an idea of what impact we're having. All right, very well. Marcos would like to know, how is choline increasing propionate production? What would be the metabolism pathways for that? So um, Marcos, when uh, hopefully we have a paper in review now, so hopefully that goes well and I can send it to you. Um, but there are interactions of choline moieties uh, to contribute to gluconeogenesis. Um, so the propionate that I showed in the slide was really just to simplify the gluconeogenic pathway. There are a lot of entry points um, and it is possible that choline could directly enter into gluconeogenesis. We didn't label choline, so I can't tell you definitively if it did. Um, what we do know is that choline shifted gene expression um, and so presumably an impact on enzyme uh, activity of the genes that control gluconeogenesis. And consistent with that, we observed increase in glucose production from the cells. And so um, what we what we think is that it's influencing regulation of that pathway. What I can't answer for sure is if it's directly being used as a precursor or if it's just modulating regulation, which seems to be the more likely of the two. Very well. Jennifer says that liver lipid increases seen at calving are usually back to normal levels by three to four weeks postpartum. How can that then affect peak and total lactation curve? And does the fat somehow damage liver functionality? Great question. So um, in our studies and most in the literature, we see the liver lipids return to prepartum content um, a little closer to um, eight weeks, at least within our studies at the University of Wisconsin. Four weeks are still a little bit elevated, uh, but the point's still well taken. If that is decreasing 
Um, what's the impact of that? This is something that's gone back to um, work over the last few decades. Does accumulation of lipid in the cell actually have a detrimental effect to liver function? And honestly, depending on what you look at, there's a little bit of mixed results on whether or not it has a decrease in liver cell function or liver cell efficiency. Um, there's also still a lot of unknowns that probably contribute to the, to the mixed results. And part of that is we don't truly understand how those lipids are remobilized. So when I say that, if you think back to any of the classic diagrams we see, the ones I learned in class, the ones that I've taught in class, we have accumulation of lipid within the cell, and then we have this line, um, and it's even in a, a very well-known review by Dr. Drakeley um, about transition cows. We have a line that goes out, and we just say that those triglycerides are back to fatty acids and can be oxidized or can be, um, can be secreted as triglyceride. What we don't know is how those triglycerides get back to fatty acids. And so that's something in other areas of my work, we had a USDA grant or have a USDA grant to look at the specific proteins that are responsible for that um, and how they're regulated because we, we don't really understand how that's working. So um, that's a lot of different pieces towards your question, but I think the short answers are that yes, the cow recovers. It's something unique to the lactating dairy cow. We don't see recovery in other species nearly as quickly. Um, so there are certainly regulatory mechanisms in place. Um, I think that the potential for long lasting impact is that while the lipids are there uh, and the adaptations that it takes to continue liver function, those probably have a long lasting impact on the regulation um, that the liver has then for the rest of lactation. All right, great. Now I have two questions here from Karina and I'll ask them together. It says very interesting facts about the calves. For how long do we need to feed choline before calving to have a positive effect on the calves? And the second question is, is how much choline do we have to feed those cows? Okay, good question. So in those studies, they um, fed the recommended um, label instructions to be consistent with the field. So they fed the 60 grams per day of reassure which is right around the 13 grams per day of choline ion. Um, and they aimed for 21 days prepartum. So they aimed to supplement the prepartum period as a part of that whole transition supplementation. Um, we analyzed after the fact how many days cows were actually supplemented prepartum. And I believe the average was right around 14 days um, that the cows consumed the choline before they calved. So, um, you know, again, they were shooting for the 21 days. The results I showed to you today are cows that had intake for 14 days before calving. All right, and our next question comes from Bruno. What are the positive relationships, if any, between choline and dietary essential fatty acids on liver metabolism and tissue mobilization, either inhibition or stimulation? Yeah, that's that's a good one. Is Joe McFadden in the audience by any chance? So um, Joe McFadden at Cornell has been looking at interactions with fatty acids and choline, uh, both in the diet and then in formation in the body. And there does appear to be some interactions there that are really interesting. Um, I believe there was an abstract last year and there, I'm sure there are some for, for this year's dairy science meeting. Um, and so I think that there are, we don't understand them uh, super well yet. The other aspect of that is interactions between the fatty acids in the liver um, and the potential interaction for choline uh, on metabolism at that point at the tissue specific level. And we've been working on that within my group in a continued fashion. We know that many of the genes within the liver controlling oxidation and gluconeogenesis are regulated by fatty acids, but it's not just the presence of fatty acids, it's both the concentration and the profile. So different fatty acids have different regulatory impacts. Um, and in the choline studies I shared today, we supplemented the cells with a um, cocktail, if you will, of fatty acids that represents what the cow has. Uh, in circulation at the time of calving, but in some of my other work uh, where we've manipulated that fatty acid cocktail, we've found that those proteins that control oxidation, gluconeogenesis, 
And then also lipid mobilization, so from stored triglyceride back to a fatty acid that can be oxidized, are influenced by the profile of fatty acids. So there's very likely going to be interactions between choline and fatty acids at the level of the liver itself as well. So unfortunately, I can't tell you specifically what those interactions are, although I think we have quite a bit of evidence that there will be interactions at multiple levels. All right, our next question comes from Ted. Could increased methyl donors affect methylation of DNA slash RNA and function of new mammary secretory cells, increased numbers of cells, et cetera? Yeah, so certainly increased availability of methyl donors will influence DNA methylation. Um, and uh, Pete Hansen at Florida is looking at the impact of that on the embryo. I am not sure if anyone's looking yet uh, at the impact on secretory cells in the mammary gland, so I can't answer that part of it. Although, um, you know, there's certainly impact of methyl donor availability on DNA methylation that will impact the cow and the developing fetus. Um, I just can't address specifically if anybody's looking at the mammary cell development due to that methylation. All right, and then a follow-up uh, uh, question from Ted. Does inflammation increase the demand for choline or methyl donors in general? Um, yeah, that's a good one. So there's two levels of that. Inflammation, we know increases the demand for glucose. There's some really good work out of Lance Baumgart's lab that quantifies the amount of glucose that inflammation consumes. Um, the, I think that the demand for choline with inflammation would be an indirect demand. If you think back to the figure that I, that I showed on the antioxidants and on reactive oxygen species, although that figure didn't directly show inflammation, we know all those pathways are related. Um, and so as we have more of that oxidative stress and inflammation within the cell, I think that the role of these key nutrients that can help mitigate that response it uh, becomes more important. And so the direct look at inflammation with choline has largely been in calves, and we've found that there's a benefit um, of choline supplementation on inflammatory pathways. So I don't know that we can say yet that the demand is increased, but I think we can say that there's a potential role for choline to mitigate the inflammation. So I'm, I'm just trying to separate out causality there. All right, and let's find one more. We are at the top of the hour. Um, and here's one from Mario. In your studies, do you see positive interactions in the supplementation of choline and methionine together? So within our cell culture studies, we do not. Um, we, in all of our cell culture studies, we fed or sorry, we supplemented cells with increasing concentrations of choline and increasing concentrations of methionine in a factorial design. So um, with or without fatty acids. So those experiments either had 16 or 32 treatments. And across all of those, the effects that we saw of methionine were present regardless of the concentration of choline and vice versa. The effects that we saw of choline were present or absent regardless of the concentration of methionine. And so from that body of literature, again, the, the last paper of that series is under review now, um, or that series of experiments um, is under review now. But in that work, we didn't see any evidence of interaction. Um, within the cow studies, if we look at them individually, the work out of Illinois, um, and work, so there's only been one that I can think of off the top of my head, factorial study that looked at methionine and choline. Again, no interaction there. Um, and so I think, um, and then and the meta-analysis um, is is a good piece of information in this puzzle too. So I think that this really points at there being different biological roles for those two nutrients. If we think about methionine as a limiting essential amino acid that's required for all protein synthesis within the body, certainly milk protein synthesis requiring it, it's a start codon, it's required for all of these things. I think that that's the biological priority of methionine when it's in the cell or the tissue or the animal. Um, and so I think that even though it's biochemically possible for there to be an interaction of methionine into some of those other pathways, I don't think it happens at the amount that it's available to the cow. So the amount of it that we're feeding 
Um, I don't think that it is being used for those alternative pathways, like the lipid-related pathways that we see choline interacting with or, or playing a role in uh, within both the cell culture and the cow studies. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. White, for spending some time with us today. This has uh, been, been very informative. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar as well. So um, if you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com, and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. Remember, you can receive one ARPAS credit for today's webinar. A certificate of participation is available to download in the handout tab on your control panel. Also, we've, uh, we're posting a, a brief uh, survey uh, following the webinar, and so we'd ask that you just spend a few moments to answer those. Uh, you will also receive an email within 48 hours with a link to the recording to today's webinar that can be shared with others in your organization. Links to past webinars are also available at balchemanh.com slash real science. Balchem is hosting a webinar every Tuesday through the end of June. Our next webinar will feature Dr. Tom Overton from Cornell University. He will talk about feeding and managing for maximum milk protein production. Go to balchemanh.com slash real science and click on the regist register now button to get signed up. Also note that we have changed the date for Dr. Hutchins' talk, previously scheduled next week, uh, June 23rd, and we've now moved that to June 30th. The change uh, will ensure that you can attend the ADSA virtual session scheduled for next week and still hear from Dr. Hutchins. On behalf of uh, Balchem and Dr. White, thank you very much for joining us today.